It is wonderful to see so many people here. My name is Stephen Sacker. I, in my day job, work for the BBC, for the BBC's World News Channel. Uh, I have a show which uh, is pretty self-explanatory. It's called Hard Talk. And my job is to ask challenging questions of the men and women who shape our world, who wield influence over all of us. And I can't think of any uh, particular sector or industry, call it what you will, that matters more to the way the world is being shaped right now than that concerned with the digital age, with the internet, with technology. It is shaping all of our futures day by day. It is changing so fast that, frankly, for somebody like me, who's not at the top of the technology tree, finds it hard to keep up. But what isn't changing, and what I think is important to note at the beginning of this hour and a half, is human nature. The technology changes, human beings, by and large, don't change quite so much in the way they think, the way they behave, the way they pursue their ambitions and desires. And it seems to me it's quite a simple but important observation at the beginning of this debate. Um, we're talking about freedom and security. If I was to ask you to vote right now on whether you think freedom and security are, on the whole, good things and important, I suspect you'd say, yes, they are. We love them. We want them. Freedom and security. Who wouldn't want them? The question is, what is the relationship between the two? And frankly, what do either of them really mean in the internet age? I think these are questions we're going to be exploring over the next 90 minutes. Let me just introduce the panel. They're drawing the curtains, so latecomers, you're going to have a problem soon. Do take your seats fast as you can. Uh, let me introduce you to our panel, and then we will get going straight away. Um, I'm going to start on my right, your left, ladies and gentlemen, with Renata Avila, who is from Guatemala. She's a human rights lawyer. She works with Global Voices. She's heavily involved in a host of civil society organizations devoted to freedom of expression and to transparency in her home country and her home region. So welcome, Renata. Uh, next, I'm going to introduce you to Elaine Weidman, who is the Vice President for Sustainability and Corporate Responsibility at Ericsson. And Elaine uh, is happy to be our representative of the private sector, the big technology companies on our sofa panel today. Welcome, Elaine. Next to Elaine, many of you will know, particularly those of you who live and work in Sweden, will know Cecilia, Cecilia Malmström, who is the EU Commissioner for Home Affairs. Uh, you're sitting next to a Brit, Cecilia, but it doesn't mean that I have deep antipathy to all things European Commission. I really don't. It's great to be with you. And thank it doesn't you mean that I have great antipathy to the Brits <laughs> either, so I'm happy to be here. Well, it's great, it's great to have you on so our far. panel. So far. Let's see how we feel in 90 minutes, eh? Um, so, uh, it is, uh, I should say, actually fantastic as a moderator, and I do quite a lot of moderating of panels, to have a panel that is heavily weighted to the female gender. It doesn't happen so very often, but it is wonderful to see it today. Now, on my left, your right, we have two other fantastic panelists. Uh, Ron, uh, Diebert is <coughs> excuse me. Ron Diebert is director at the Canada Centre for Global Security Issues, writes a whole lot on the very issues at the heart of our debate today. And Ron has just told me, and I think this is worth passing on to you all, that he has a book that has been published today, ladies and gentlemen. On, yeah, why not? Why not? Those of you clapping haven't read it. Let's see if you're still clapping when you've read it. But it, it's called Black Code. And I'm told it's available at every good bookshop and, of course, online. So uh, can, good luck with that, Ron. And next to Ron, Leslie. Leslie Harris, who is president and CEO for the Center for Democracy and technology, and like Ron, is a prolific writer and thinker on uh, issues concerning security in our digital age. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing all of our panelists speak. I'm going to kick this, this session off just with a, a very broad brush thought, and in a way it picks up and perhaps 
questions with a skeptical eye some of the comments that we heard in the first session, and maybe particularly, and no offense to him because he's a great man and, and an important player in foreign affairs in Europe, but Carl Bildt, uh, a man of great optimism, I think it's fair to say, uh, when he's talking about the potentiality of the internet and what it's doing for individual freedom, what it's doing for development, uh, and how in many ways we should be very optimistic about where it is all heading. My take is a little bit different. Obviously, I spend a lot of time looking at global political trends, um, and it seems to me, and it comes back to my point about human nature, changing technology, unchanging human beings, it seems to me that those who want to suppress and abuse freedom have been doing a lot of catching up lately. You know, the internet age, I think, has spawned so much idealism, so much desire to make the very best of our new ability to communicate, to receive and give information across borders, uh, right around this planet. You know, we've been feeling good for a long time about the internet, and now I'm personally feeling not quite so good. I still see the enormous, immense, unimaginable potential, but I see real dangers too. And I see the malign forces within our planet and within our own human natures, perhaps, becoming much more sophisticated in the way they use the technology. You know, we've got to talk about everything from invasive data collection to repression of, of unpleasant, unwanted, or dissident opinion. We've got to talk about crime. We've got to talk about espionage and surveillance. We've got to talk about fundamentals of security and even so-called cyber warfare. These are all things that seems to me will be up for grabs for the next 90 minutes. I just want to end my introduction with this I just wrote down something that our Pakistani contributor said in the first panel. He said this, he said, in Pakistan, every citizen is seen by the state as a potential enemy. I slightly paraphrased, but that's pretty much what he said. And it struck me as one of the most interesting and frightening things that I heard at the beginning of today's event. And I think it's something we should bear in mind as I get the panel to make their opening remarks. So I'm going to do it this way, simply in the order I introduced you. So, Renata, okay. just give me your opening thoughts to what I've just said and what you heard in the first panel and how you want to take this debate forward. Uh, well, I don't know if I, if I should start with a suggestion. My suggestion will be, uh, before, I would like to hear from the audience, and I think that there are lots of assumptions and lots of uh, perceptions, uh, probably because of what we hear from media in general. So I will, I would like to start as opening remarks with a little game with the audience. And I will describe a, situ a situation, and I will give you different options of countries. So uh, uh, after I describe the situation, when I name the country, I want you to raise a hand if you think that that's the country I'm talking about. Uh, so first situation that I want to share. In this uh, country, there are 8,000 cameras, CCTV cameras, surveillance cameras, uh, deployed everywhere, everywhere to tackle crime. That includes uh, drones, that includes uh, units to collect digital evidence, so that means that the, the car parks in front of your house and collects everything from your devices without entering your house. Uh, and that also includes uh, a public, uh, pri private-public partnership uh, with private security companies sharing the data, all the data they, they also collect, all databases, names, uh, traffic, they intercept everything with the intelligence and the police of this country. So, option number one, who thinks that this is uh, Moscow in Russia? Well, I'll tell you what, give us all three options and then we'll okay. mull it over for one second and uh, then we'll oh, yeah, vote. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so right. what are the three options? So option number one is Moscow, Russia. Yeah. Op option number two is Boston, US. And uh, the third option is Mexico City in, in Mexico. Who thinks that it's uh, uh, Moscow in Russia? Did you hear that, everybody? Your options are Moscow, Boston, Massachusetts, or Mexico City. And so we're starting with those who want to vote for... Moscow. Which one are we starting with? Uh, Moscow. Moscow. Who wants to vote for Moscow? Well, you're a brave man, sir, because you're... The, oh, no, there's a few. All right, well, I would say Moscow is a, is a, is a not, not a majority. Moscow is a very poor minority right now. 
So, so okay, well, we've had the vote for Moscow. Which one do you want us to vote for next? Uh, Boston. Who wants to vote for Boston, Massachusetts? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you live in Boston, Massachusetts? Uh, all right, well, Boston's got a fantastic amount of support. Uh, who wants to vote for Mexico City? Well, actually, you are correct, guys. It is about uh, this uh, program called uh, Ciudad Segura, Safe City in Mexico. Uh, the mayor of the city of Mexico, he was, he was awarded like, lots of awards, best mayor in the world. And uh, it, it, privacy of citizens and oversight was not discussed at all while implementing uh, this kind of program. And all the narrative of media and all the narrative of uh, analysts of security and, of course, companies, because there's huge profit on this, uh, uh, was on, oh, how successful it is. And actually, there's no data to back such claims. So it is, it is very interesting. This is not a new program. It was how long? How many years has that program been? I think been? that it has been running like at, at least for three or four years. Three or four years? Yeah, drones and all this. And does the municipality point to major benefits that have been achieved because of this sort of surveillance and information gathering system? There is no hard evidence that such sophisticated system of surveillance actually contributed uh, specifically to reduce the rate of crime. It's because uh, you, can, uh, you can, of course, do make some, uh, somehow easier the, the work for police, but not, not necessarily uh, uh, wake yeah. the, the, the burden on citizens and their private, private communications, as, as one member of the audience uh, described. Well, uh, I think it, it, it's, it's a fascinating and thought-provoking opening example, and we can tease out some of what that means and, and what the philosophy is behind it. Do you quickly then, Renata, have a second one? Because I quite yeah, like this game. Let, is, let's just is, play is, it one more time. It's far easier. Okay. Uh, there was a demonstration in the main square, and uh, all the mobile phones were shut down because of security concerns, because those demonstrators uh, were organized by text message and by uh, telephones. Uh, so they decided to just shut down the, the, the system. So options are uh, London in the UK, uh, Panama City in Panama, or um, uh, Syria, Damascus, Syria. What okay. do you think? Uh, right. Option number uh, one, London in the UK? Who's voting London, UK? I think I am, because I feel like it, and I'm British, so I'm allowed to. Okay, I'm voting London. Yeah, next one. Uh, Panama City in Panama? Uh, Ron looks like he's very confident, so I'm worried. Okay, Panama, uh, and the third one? Damascus, Damascus. Syria. Yeah, that, that, well, you know, we've got, a, hard to tell. we've got a spread. We have actually got a genuine well, spread of opinion. What's the answer? While in all of the cities that happened, uh, ah. actually what I wanted to highlight is that in somewhere, somewhere like Panama, that's going on, and media is not caring about that. It, it was not even reported. I mean, I mean... Uh, when I felt the situation so close from home, I was really, really worried because uh, uh, when there's some very uh, important and strategic uh, country with this kind of uh, problems, everyone is like, oh my God, it's, it's, internet is down here or there, or the mobile network is down uh, in this particular country. When these threats are uh, against invisible communities, in this case was indigenous communities, uh, the problem is invisible to the press mm -hmm. as well. Yes, uh, our countries are not superpowers, but uh, it is like the, the effect of the Christmas tree mm. uh, lights. If we lose one, we lose... It, it is a chain effect. We lose everything. If we uh, start ignoring a violation of rights in one country, in one city, by uh, a major that does not respect uh, principles, we will start like, uh, oh, if my neighbor is doing that, I will do it as well. So that's my introductory well, remark on this topic. No, I, I thank you very much, Renato. And it's actually terrific to wrestle with case studies early on because, you know, we're talking principles and big picture, but I think it's always great to relate that to actual concrete examples. So I thank you very much. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, I should say also, I didn't say it at the very beginning, but I hope it's obvious. This is relaxed, it's informal, and it is totally 
interactive. It would be a shame if you came to an internet forum and it wasn't interactive, wouldn't it? So from the very get-go, when you're hearing things that you feel you want to ask a question about or make a particular comment on, stick your hand up. We've got the roving mics. We're going to keep that going throughout the 90 minutes. You lot are not shy. I got that message in the first session. So uh, we're going to keep that going. And also the um, sort of curators of our online experience, the Twitter feed and whatever, are going to bring in comments that um, may be coming up on the big screens as well. But we want to we want to make sure that people watching online uh, can feedback their questions and thoughts as well. So I'll be turning to them uh, now. Elaine, give me your opening sort of gambit on this issue. Um, well, for disclosure, I just want to say I voted for Boston because I'm actually from Boston, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so I picked my hometown. But um, I've been. Um, these days living in Sweden and, and here representing Ericsson, a, a quite well-known Swedish company. But for those of you not familiar with Ericsson, mm -hmm. um, Ericsson was founded in 1876. So quite a well over 100 years. And, and throughout this 100 year plus history, um, one thing has remained constant. And we have seen um, the communication trends come and go and change over time. But one thing that I would say is a, one of the fundamental values of, of our company and our, and our heritage and our culture as a company is that access to communication is a basic human need. And so th throughout the, this time, we have been working on really driving accessibility and affordability of, of communications in, in these days, primarily in the mobile space, to make it as affordable and accessible as possible. So that is the, the number one, you could say, intention of the company. And I think um, going back to uh, some of the remarks uh, that I was listening to on the earlier panel, I, th I think that um, Ibele from Yahoo, for example, raised uh, an interesting point about what is the role of companies. Because as um, I would say there's going into the communication history, there's three things happening right now that are making the whole discussion, whether you talk about internet freedom, whether you talk about cybersecurity, three things are happening now that are changing the world as we know it, and this is mobility, broadband, and cloud. And these three technology forces, you could say, are, are evolving at a quite rapid pace, and that pace is, in fact, far outpacing the pace of policy. And so I think that given the technological change and, and how quickly the world that we live in is changing, we need to find a way to really um, govern uh, what we call freedom of internet. And, and I think the, um, the comment uh, or the discussion earlier on, on the significance of the UN recognizing uh, freedom of internet in the, in the human rights domain is is actually very important because it gives a, a legitimacy to the discussion and, and how can we, and, I, and, I, and when I say we, I don't mean Ericsson, I mean we collectively here, how can we ensure that the, the same rights, human rights that we enjoy in the physical world, mm -hmm. how can we make sure that they are protected and valid and respected in the cyber world? Uh, so I think this is just um, really a, a dilemma that, that or, or brings up new challenges as technology evolves that, that needs collective discussion. And I ask you this not as a representative of Ericsson, but just as it happens, a representative of, of corporate culture on our panel. Uh, why on earth should we trust the corporate giants who are such big players in the development of our digital age, why should we trust their commitment to our privacy, to our freedom, to our security? I think that um, it's, we're working on some research right now, actually, uh, in different countries around the world, and I'm not going to give the, the full results of the study because I don't have it yet, but we start to see that in some parts of the world, the general public, if you're in a country like Sweden or the US, you're more apt to trust the law enforcement or the government of that country to protect your rights. But if you're in a country like uh, Pakistan or Egypt, you actually put more trust in the companies. And this is a kind of broad generalization, but, but and I think the is role... Is that wise, do you think? 
Uh, I don't know if it's wise or not wise. I'm just saying what we're starting to see. No, it's an interesting observation. Yeah. I just wonder, you know, it, yeah. it, it comes back to the way businesses work. I mean, you talked about your heritage at Ericsson, your hundreds of years of commitment to, you know, improving communication between human beings. I mean, it all sounds great, but ultimately your commitment's to your bottom line. Um, and it's, I'm just wondering, in, in a cultural sense, whether you are confident whether you're talking about the developed world, developing world, whatever, mm. that, that in the boardroom, in the big technology corporations, there is a real understanding of the importance of these fundamental rights, starting well, with privacy. You asked so many questions in one, but to go back to the first one, which I think is about trust, um, you ask about trust, I think that because the technology is evolving at, at such a fast pace, I think there has to be some kind of trust in the companies. Uh, I don't know, I guess it goes on, to what is your core business and what is the nature of your business? If you're in the business of, I don't know, um, very devious surveillance technology, I, I, I don't know if I would trust that type of a company, but that's not our business and we focus quite a lot. And in fact, our board d does discuss this and our executive leadership team does discuss this about the ethical challenges because if we don't have the trust of our shareholders, of our customers, of our stakeholders, it's going to impact the bottom line anyway. So I think these days, trust is something you know, that is, is so important to, to many companies. I mean, that's just uh, our experience. Sure. But, yeah. Well, no, thanks, Elaine, for that. Uh, Cecilia, I'm going to bring you in. You're the EU Commissioner for Home Affairs. Uh, you presumably spend a lot of your waking hours thinking about cyber security and I just wonder you know as I frame the debate early on and, and my nagging concerns that you know the malign forces within human nature are becoming more and more sophisticated I mean is that something that that you uh, resonates with you in your day job well, well it does and as the debate has shown so far today it, it's very complex because on the one hand, I share the optimism that the former panel expressed that, that of course, the internet is such a fantastic and powerful instrument in the fight for democracy and human rights. It's also a very good instrument for, for the economy, and it has made our lives, our private lives, a new revolution. We live our, our digital lives today in a way we wouldn't think about uh, ten, 10 years ago, and of course, that has to, has to be protected, and we need to make sure that that, that can be, be, be done in the different ways that has been discussed to, to make sure that, that states don't interfere on interline with the freedom of expression and, and, and survey that their citizens who, who do not agree uh, with, with the regime. Um, but we should also make sure that we don't build up new international uh, convention regime governance, uh, because that we already have the instruments uh, necessary there. We have the Budapest Convention, and that's very much part of my job to try to promote as many countries as possible to signing the, the, the Budapest Convention. But one thing that makes me a, a bit less optimistic, uh, of course, is that, that there are also other forces in the internet that, that we don't want to have there, and they actually intrude on our freedom because it, it, they, introduce, they hinder me to be a very active digital citizen. I, I, and we have seen recent research in Europe that actually a lot of European citizens, a vast majority, are worried about internet security and that, that they think that they cannot fully do all their errands, pay their uh, bills, uh, buy their books, they use the different social networks on the internet because they are afraid of having their identity hacked or their bank account or that there would be fraud committed on the internet and that we need to look at as well. Is that fear rising? The evidence Absolutely. does it suggest it's that, rising. That and, it is. and we also see that, that criminals, of course, also take advantage of, of internet. And there are a lot of uh, organized crime groups and individuals who, who are there who, um, uh, who work with identity theft to do uh, steal bank accounts, who um, are very much involved in sexual child abuse online. We see that people, individuals, become radicalized on that. We had the recent, we had many examples, but we can take someone close here, the, the Anders Breivik case in Norway. He spent a lot of his life being radicalized on, on internet. And that poses new challenges to the law enforcement agencies, because of course, police work needs to be done on internet as well. But on the other hand, how do you make sure that, that you don't um, that you don't push that too far. Yeah, uh, because to be clear, I mean, he, he, this isn't, 
if you're talking about Breivik or, or hate speech or whatever, I mean, there are laws in all of Europe's countries mm -hmm. against hate speech. Yep. So Most the laws already exist. It's just a question of the platform, mm -hmm. the delivery system exactly. by which those words are reaching an audience. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not quite clear what you're saying here. You want a whole raft of of new, more far-reaching laws, or you just mm. want to find ways of practically implementing what is already out there in no, terms of No, it's just outlining what we also see on, on internet. It's not only a tool for, for democracy or freedom, it's also a tool for organized crime uh, who are there and who, who commit a lot of these crimes, which of course causes a lot of victims, but also are a cost for, for, for the society, uh, critical infrastructure that, that is attacked and so on. So the police, I don't think we need a whole lot of new laws, but we need to discuss how the laws that works in the, in the real world, how can they work on internet as well? <coughs> and for that, it is so important to have these kind of forums where we discuss with industry, with the civil society, uh, with, with researchers, the academic world, and so on. How, how do we, we set the, the, the rules there and, and, mm. and the platforms? And that, that is it's not obvious. Uh, but, but of course, police needs also to be doing their work on internet. What is illegal and what we can agree upon, I mean, organized crime as only is illegal here, is also, of course, illegal on internet. Because if we don't um, address this issue, and it's being addressed, of course, uh, every day, then it will also be a very threat, a threat in itself to, to digital freedom. And that's, right. So it's not a trade-off between freedom and security, but both elements need to be there and looked at because they are linked. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting because uh, Carl Bildt, your compatriot, said that freedom and security are essentially the same thing, two sides of the same coin, I think he said. I mean, uh, it's probably easier to say that in Sweden than in some other countries, or, or to think that, or mm -hmm. to see it as, as being frankly, as simple as that. But anyway, I, I, I want to bring um, this side of the sofa in. Right. So uh, why don't you go, Leslie, okay. and have a thought on this, and then Ron. Well, so I think my initial thought is that we're, we're lacking a vo vocabulary to be talking about the same thing. Um, you know, I agree entirely that a secure internet is an underpinning of a free internet and an internet that supports human rights. Um, I think the danger is that cyber security has become the new national security. We spent the first decade of this century using national security as sort of the phrase that allows anything to happen. Now, because I think security is not one single problem, like I would not have put hate speech into the security bucket uh, for me and I expect for technologists that we're talking about intrusions into systems, and in, in any event, I think it just demonstrates but that... You, forgive me for interrupting, but you, if you were um, a Jew living in a particular well, a Jew, quarter so. of, if, of Budapest... Well, I then teach as a, in Budapest. As, okay, so if you're, if you're Jewish, you're in Budapest, yes. and you are seeing the internet right. being used to propagate anti-Semitic right. bile, I didn't say um, it wasn't a crime. But it, it is a security issue for you as no, a Jewish resident no, of no, Budapest, not, is it not? It's not a security issue. I mean, I think this is our problem is that um, there are a lot of laws that protect us in various ways from, you know, from things we don't like. Europe has hate speech laws, the US doesn't. That's two hour discussion, hmm. a different two hour discussion. Um, but. When we talk about cybersecurity, we have this tendency to take every evil that happens, every act that is a crime, and call all of that cybersecurity. And I think when we do that, and when we're not always talking about the same thing, then we start to propose sweeping and overreaching solutions and risk human rights. So we need a common vernacular. Um, and the, re the rhetoric in particular that's associated with cybersecurity, don't know how it is over here, but in the United States, the problem is touted by some as the coming cyber Armageddon. Now, I actually think so that security is a big problem. It's a growing problem. We're seeing more threats uh, across the board, well, going kinds of threats. But you can be sure that the solutions are gonna lack nuance. <laughs> Um, they're going to lack proportionality, and that rights are going to get kicked to the curb anytime you are doing policy in a framework of cyber 
Armageddons. In the United States, we also use cyber Pearl Harbors and cyber 9-11s. Um, it seems to me that if, that if we want to focus on the legitimate issues of security, um, we have to define what we mean and see if we can come up with, and I think this is why when security proposals were getting kicked around the ITU, I, I think it was highly revealing that you know, there were countries that believed that speech against the government and speech that might foment disagreement in the country were cybersecurity threats, and yet, which obviously we wouldn't support, and yet we were talking about a single treaty that would govern us all. Um, you know, I, mean, I think these are the underpinnings of the real issues that were happening at, at, at the ITU. But if we don't get these problems defined uh, in, a, in a collective manner, and, and from my perspective, we can never get the world to agree. I would like to get internet freedom advocates to sort of engage in a collective process where we decide what belongs in that bucket, and we decide what, it could be a, pri it could be a crime, you may want to go prosecute it, but when you talk about cyber security solutions, um, belong in the cyber security you, you, budget. You, you, I'm assuming you've worked it out in your own mind, for yourself. You're happy oh, that I, you can I, define I, it? No, no. I, I can't define it. I mean, no. I, I limit it in some ways to intrusions, uh, and whether it's an intrusion into a network or into an email or taking over, that I don't think it's activities right. that are pure speech. It's not a presentation of an, out, you know, of an right. opinion. And, it's, and it's I'm sure actually, Ron can do better than me well, coming that, up with, with, with a definition. But, but I think it's a discussion we have to have. In the United States, it's interesting, yeah. we've had a very big fight over um, our Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that's being used for people violating terms of service, um, online terms of service of various providers. Um, that can't be the right answer. We can't be making, I signed into you know, Facebook or MySpace with a fake name, and that's a cybersecurity crime. So I, I think that this is the biggest issue that we have, that the internet freedom community needs to get on the same page and be able to say, this is the bucket. Um, because if you don't, I mean, in the United States, and we, have, we have debated if you want to play which country or which city, um, kill switches for the internet, giving the president power for kill switches for the internet. What, to close it down? Yeah, a kill switch. Who knows what it means? Mm. The, the, the belief that there's well, a little button. There are countries where you can push a button. If it's President Bush or President Obama might make a difference. It might uh, mean different things to it, different presidents. It might mean different things to different presidents. So, so mm. I, I just think fundamentally the first thing that we've got to do in this community, the community of people who want a free internet, is decide what's in that bucket. And then I think once we do, we're going to see that these are very, it isn't a single thing. Um, you know, we have different well, kinds of actors. We have, you know, people breaking into networks to steal things. We have countries breaking into other sure. countries' networks to, you know, for, for spying. We have, you know, we're blowing up nuclear reactors. We're, we're doing a variety of things. So the idea that we're going to have a cybersecurity law that applies to all these pieces is, I think, how we wind up with overreach. Uh, well, Leslie, let me let yeah. me stop you there. Let's bring Ron in. Uh, I don't know whether that's something you want to pick up on. Sure. Or, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm happy to pick up there. Uh, you know, I think the way I would uh, begin to address the topic is by asking security for whom and mm. security for what. And this is an important question. Uh, we're talking about something that's absolutely critical here security of our common communications ecosystem and all of our infrastructure. We live in the world of the Internet of Things, so it's all around us, and security is of that domain is of critical importance. I think what's happened, though, if you take a step back and look, there's a process that uh, was predictable, largely, and that is whenever something is securitized, there's a knee-jerk, instinctual reaction to default to a certain tradition. I call it the real politique or the realist approach. And that entails certain characteristics like hierarchy, secrecy, centralization, mm -hmm. uh, the entrusting of power and authority to defense and military agencies. And so not surprisingly, we're seeing now uh, the three and four letter agencies, signals intelligence agencies, the NSAs, GCHQs of the world, 
assuming power and responsibility over securing uh, this domain. And as a consequence of that, we see several things. One is, uh, with all due respect to the Minister Bill, a, a rolling back of checks and balances around surveillance in the liberal industrialized world. So in Canada, the United States, United Kingdom, in Europe in some cases, we're seeing the same thing. A rollback of checks and balances, protections for privacy in the name of cybersecurity. But are you Another saying thing. that that rollback is happening covertly or is it? No, <laughs> if it were covertly, in some cases it is covertly, but unfortunately it's also overtly. There are right. legislation that is extreme what's being done in the name yeah, of cybersecurity. Yeah, but that then if it's over and if it's through legislation, it, it has the stamp of democratic approval. Yeah, I mean, it's, and it's and, a, and if, if Cecilia is right, and if, if every sort of opinion poll and uh, way of tapping into the public mood suggests that people are increasingly concerned yeah, well, about uh, internet security, then maybe the legislators sure. are well, doing this, what this they is, need to do. This is where I think we need to have a conversation like right. we're having here, right? We're a more sophisticated conversation, frankly. Um, and I think I was going to leave this for later, but one of my... Um, challenges really to this community here. It's essentially the civil society, internet mm. freedom community. Civil society needs a cybersecurity strategy. You know, civil society tends to think about security as something that the people in the uniforms do. And they don't really like using the language of security because it's something they're not comfortable with. We're against security. And that's a, the wrong approach. We need to come up with not only, you know, human rights are, need to be secured and so on. That's, that's easy for us. The difficult challenge is actually to talk to the people who deal with the threats to the critical infrastructure, the very real security issues around cyberspace, and say, okay, what are the solutions to this? Can we come up with a program of action to introduce legislation that protects human rights, privacy, while also securing this space for us? I just wanted to get back to one point, that one of the consequences of what's happening now, it's important because it picks up on something from the last panel, and this is, I think, uh, even more perverse, is that when you, this logic unfolds and you have this deference to the three-letter agencies and the militarization of cyberspace occurring, uh, not surprisingly, a whole market uh, emerges to service the needs of the defense and intelligence community. This is my single biggest concern right now. Uh, in the last panel, it was, there was a mention of a report of ours at the Citizen Lab on this British company, Gamma Group, whose products have shown up in more than 30 countries around the world. It's essentially commercialized spyware. But that's the tip of an iceberg, and it's actually an easy case in and of itself. What concerns me are the number of companies, from telecommunications companies to other, uh, other companies in this sector, that are now providing services and products to policymakers, to military intelligence agencies that they never before imagined, deep packet inspection, cell phone tracking. As we've turned our digital lives inside out, there's this enormous market opportunity to track and monitor, and in some cases even engage in offensive computer network attacks. That is fundamentally changing the domain of cyberspace right now, and it's very difficult that, to address. That it. is an expression of the free market. So are you, you know, there's a demand for it. So are it's, you suggesting that there, there should be interventions in the marketplace to, to stop well, these products being either made or sold? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult question. question to address because you, in some cases, I'll, I'll give you an example of another Citizen Lab report, uh, Blue Coat. It's a, a company that provides uh, essentially surveillance equipment to monitor network traffic. Uh, we found blue coat instances of blue coat devices used all over the internet, but showing up in countries that are some of the world's most notorious abusers of human rights. Mm -hmm. That's a technology that's actually critical to the functioning of the internet. But in some circumstances, some context, it can be used to identify people and throw them in jail. Yes. What you do about it, I'm not sure. Well, it's a fascinating point, and I want to pick up on it because I've got some thoughts in my own head about it, but, but I, hands are beginning to go up and I want to make sure that we reflect people's questions and observations from the floor. So Madam, we'll get a microphone to you. Just tell us your name and uh, give us your question or your thought. Uh, and people, other people wave hands because this debate already is, I think, getting very interesting and I want your input. And also moderators, I'm going to come to you in a sec. Ma'am, go uh, on. My name is Jahan. I'm from uh, Pakistan. I represent Pasha, the IT association, as well as work with a civil society organization called Bolobhi. 
My fear is, I think one of the things that I think we need to figure out how to tackle is that when governments talk about cybersecurity, they instill, instill in the population a fear. And then you find that no matter how much you may speak up on behalf of civil society, civil society itself, the mass civil society, is so scared that they figure it is justified to put in surveillance. It is justified to shut down mobile mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. It is justified to do whatever it takes to keep us safe. And that is even more scary than the control that the governments have. So when the population supports this, how do we tackle that? Well, we need mm. to figure out That's how to a, tackle that. Can, can I just, I want to bring Renata in because I was very struck. Uh, you mentioned Panama. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in a country like Panama, when, when the sort of draconian measures are taken to close down the internet or whatever, to thwart a demonstration or whatever it was in that particular situation, is it possible to gauge the, the general public's reaction and, and, and to assess whether you know, the government's proper message about you know, the, the, the threat being posed gets home to the point where people end up supporting these draconian measures? Well, I think, I think that it is not just in countries like Panama. I, and I think that uh, there's, I, I want to add an element here that I was like dying to mention. Go on then, go on. And <laughs> it is that uh, with, the, with the new technologies and with the unprecedented access to technologies that we have in, country, in corrupt countries, and actually uh, with corrupt companies mm. as well, uh, um, we are witnessing an unprecedented level of accountability by citizens, crowdsourced, uh, uh, an unprecedented use of our right to truth and our right to uh, have access to the information relevant for our situation. And also we are uh, witnessing different expressions of dissent on the internet. Right of assembly, uh, sometime before it was not possible to have simultaneous right of assembly of citizens from Pakistan and from Guatemala and from Mexico and from Canada protesting against surveillance laws or uh, these kind of issues. And this is very important because I am very worried. New directives on cyber security uh, are framing these kind of activities under terrorism. And that's such a dangerous level mm -hmm. that I, I really want to mention here. Uh, they are creating new, uh, such uh, uh, directives are, are creating new vocabulary such as, and I'm sorry if I'm, but I think no, no, it's mentioned, I have to mention this. Go on. Uh, this term, cyber terrorist, used to freedom of information activists yeah. online. Uh, uh, also, uh, this use of the new hacktivist term to uh, uh, so uh, constitutions or regulations will not protect the Act the right of any citizen to publish information as journalism. But this new activism term that uh, uh, used to uh, circumvent the protections that e everyone has under Article 19. And also, uh, I, I want to mention this because this is another uh, justification to uh, make people scare or, uh, well, I think about that, even that, searches yeah, that, online. That was the lady's yeah. point from Pakistan. Uh, sir, you had your hand up for a, a while at the back. You've got your hand way up in the air. You're even standing up. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Uh, all, the only problem is that you're about a million miles from the microphone. So, uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, sir. You go, you go first, and then we'll go straight to the gentleman behind you. Yeah, go on. With the microphone, you go. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Reza. I'm, I'm from Bangladesh. I used to work with Article 19 Bangladesh office. Um, I would like to mention a few things. Like, first of all, the, the vocabulary things was not talked much, but I guess and I understand what is tried to, underst uh, tried to indicate that there's not much enough vocabulary is there to tackle the current situation. And I guess I want to like to problematize the word freedom itself and also try to problematize the word security itself. Because uh, as, I mean, if you look, look, look back to the local language, and in, in our case, we have a very different meaning of freedom. Mm -hmm. Probably sometimes it's close to the English word emancipation, and sometimes we don't use the word what constitute the freedom into the European or the American context. So I think 
to look into the solution-based approach, probably some vocabulary lackings is there. We look into the, we have to look into that mm -hmm. issue. And on the other hand, the security, as our friend said that the civil societies are not much interested to talk about the security, especially probably you mentioned on the, who are involved in the ICT sector. But on the other hand, of course, the, the civilian control over the military or the intelligence, that there is a source of human rights-based principle into the Johannesburg Declaration and other places. So probably, we can, we can use some extent those principles and the best practices to intervening uh, the cyber security and getting a control over the home ministry probably, or the home ministry of the national governments. Mm. And lastly, I would like to say like, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, I want to see the wisdom the, from the panel, like, uh, yes, we can talk about the freedom, security, communication surveillance, or uh, cyber threat and other things. But I would like to go back to the point what you started, the moderator you started, mm -hmm. the human nature. The how human nature act or react when there is a surveillance, when there is a, is a uh, perceived threat, when there is a uh, term and stigmatize people as a cyber terrorist or the terrorist. So I want to see our wisdom to discuss on that track how human nature behaved and how human nature react and act. Okay, thank okay. you very much, yeah. All right, well thank you, thank you very much for that. Uh, we'll just go straight to the gentleman behind you. Go on, sir. Hello, hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Jan Kleissen, I'm with the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. Uh, what I would like to draw attention to is the fact that freedom and security are not mutually incompatible. Um, one of the founding fathers of my organization, a gentleman called Winston Churchill, that the moderator and others may well know, uh, pointed out that you cannot have security without human rights. And our Budapest Convention, I'm very happy to hear that the EU is very actively promoting the Budapest Convention on cybercrime, actually contains a specific human rights clause. In other words, uh, the convention foresees that the best way to fight cybercrime is to respect human rights and the rule of law at the same time. And we just had a major conference against terrorism in Strasbourg last week where it was demonstrated that those countries that fight terrorism, also on the internet, while protecting human rights and the rule of law, are a lot more effective than those that don't. Thank you. All right. Um, panel, is there anything you particularly want to pick up on from the comments we've just heard? I, I would like to actually just, since the cybercrime convention was brought up, it illustrates precisely a point I was making. In Canada, uh, the government, public safety minister, uh, put forward a bill, C-30, it was very controversial. It was our uh, lawful access bill. The bill was put forward precisely to be in compliance with the cybercrime convention. Uh, but the problem is the, the whole message there about the rule of law somehow got lost in, in the mix. And so uh, the bill's most controversial component uh, contained a section on having internet service providers, telecommunication companies, in the name of security, uh, uh, pass data that they acquire on all of us to law enforcement agencies, to intelligence agencies, without judi judicial oversight, without a warrant. If we are doing that in liberal democratic societies, we're losing sight of what it is we're securing in the first place. And not only that, we're lending legitimacy to those very practices abroad that we ostensibly oppose in places like China and Iran. Fortunately, the bill was defeated because there was public outrage, bumbling by the public safety minister contributed to it as well. But one of the haunting things that emerged in the debate around it was that the police routinely go to internet service providers, get access on all of us Canadians without a warrant, that's standard practice. It's what's happening today in Canada. It's happening in most industrialized countries. We've got a really big problem where basic checks and balances, which are at the heart of liberal democracy, are being eroded in the name of cybersecurity. Just to add a point, I mean, we've been talking now almost an hour about security and cybersecurity. I think it's telling that 
All of our conversation is around what governments should do and not do, because we have this very government-centric approach to cybersecurity. Um, and governments do, as, as Ron said, we're also having a data sharing fight in the United States. And cybersecurity really is a much broader set of responsibilities that starts with users, uh, that moves to the companies who are producing things and building secure technologies, that moves to corp global corporate norms about how you behave, how an ISP might behave if its users have uh, botnets on their computers. I mean, you could, you know, all the way sort of up the chain with government being an actor, but honestly, not necessarily in some situations, the most important actor. And this sort of cybersecurity as the new national security has sort of swept all of that aside and moved well, us it's a, it's a, right I, back into the thank same you, realm. Leslie. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to hear you two respond to that. I mean, you sort of, as a politician, and, and you, Elaine, as, as a, a corporate chief, you well, start. I, I think we, we talk about such a broad subject, so, so it gets a little bit... Uh, well, it, it's very wide. Because it sure is. It sure is, and, and that's what's making it so difficult and, and challenging, because, of course, uh, government surveillance of citizens, that is, is something we, we must stand up to, we, we stand up against. We should not uh, allow that, and it is important but, but you, that... We, that uh, but that, that's not something we do allow. It. We've established in this conversation, it happens all the time. I mean, you, Britain, I think, is the most mm -hmm. densely surveilled country right. in the world. It happens every hour of every day, uh, in pretty much every country. It does. And so, that's so it's no good saying we want to stop that and No, that was going to be my, 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 my second sentence. And when it does happen, we must make sure that it has, that it is protected in law, that there is possibility of redress and information. But that doesn't mean that, that we promote massive surveillance of, of citizens' opinions and, 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 and freedoms. But what I am talking about is not about setting up new laws in the European Union. Nobody has ever proposed, in what I've heard, a global cybersecurity law in the European Union. Uh, Thank not God. seriously. Thank, uh, the, thank God, of course, because that we don't want. Yeah. What it is, is about making sure to fight the real crime that is on the internet. The real crime, the, the thief, the rape, the, the, the fraud, the stealing that is going on internet yeah. as well. And where we need to discuss between law enforcement authorities, how do we do this? Yeah. Because some are very advanced, some use means that you and I would probably not be agreeing upon. In some police stations in Europe, and also of course in other places in the world, there's not even a computer. How do we connect them when organized crime groups work all across the, the, the nations. How do we deal with this? Policing is about getting information. Yeah. That we can agree about. But w under what rules will you get that information be, uh, without ma making sure that you have this massive uh, surveillance system that, that will all can, can fall well, into... To, as a politician uh, who, who, you know, who is charged with protecting Europeans as mm. commissioner, do you, do you listen to sort of thinkers, think tankers and uh, activists like Ron and Leslie and think, you know, they have it too easy. They can pontificate and they can say, oh, goodness, you know, this, it's becoming a catch-all phrase now, cybersecurity being used by politicians and governments to erode fundamental freedoms. Uh, do you think it's, do you listen to them and get angry? bit hacked off? <laughs> no, I very seldom get angry, at least if I get my coffee regularly. I'm, I'm quite <laughs> um, relaxed about that. Of course we do. I, I mean, I spend, now cybersecurity is not my only responsibility, but we spend hours and hours now trying to connect with industry, with the different uh, civil society organization, uh, with academics to try to find the answers, because we don't have the answer. And everybody who, who, who claim that they have all the answers how to, how to do that is, is not uh, honest. Uh, but we need to recognize that, that there is a problem of criminality online. And if we don't address that, uh, the, the freedom of internet is also threatened. And I think we agree with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah. and I wanted to bring Elaine that. in, because I know she wanted to say something earlier. Go on, Elaine. Yeah, a couple of things. One, I think, um, to pick up on what, what Leslie mentioned about responsibility, I think this truly is a shared responsibility. You can't say it's the government or it's the company or, or it's the general public or civil society more broadly. I think it's, this is truly an area that is <laughs> intensifying and, and will grow in importance. And so that's one thing I, I think is the concept of shared responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I think this event, we were here last year, I think it's such a great way to get the mm -hmm. dialogue going, but there needs to be much more of the sharing of the responsibility. And then 
the other word that, that triggers me is responsibility because it hasn't come up yet uh, today, but one thing we're working actively with is the new UN guiding principles for business and human rights right. and what is the company's role in respecting human rights. And when we look at this as a company, I personally have been involved now for over a year in, in some of the commission um, multi-stakeholder dialogues on, on the role of companies in this. And one thing that I have been very frustrated about is that, and I hear it here too, like everyone says, the ICT sector or it's so grossly overgeneralized, and we talk about surveillance. I mean, and these are very broad terms, and I think where you can have an impact, and now I'm speaking from the company side, is you have to know where are you in that ecosystem, where are you in that value chain to see what is your responsibility. And censorship is very different than shutting off a network, is very different than misuse of lawful intercept. Is, so there's so many different you know, potential areas where misuse or, or abuse of human rights can occur that I mm. you need to know where you are in that value chain, in the ecosystem, and what the potential risks are. Mm. And that's, we have published this paper today, it's on the conference website, ICT and Human Rights, and e it's not a book, but, uh, <laughs> no, <there's... laughs> but it's a paper, and I think right. trying to get awareness among the public about uh, these issues is very important. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, I'm, I want to hear from our moderators. Moderators, g give us uh -huh. some questions or comments that have come up uh, on the uh -huh. Twitter feed or wherever. Uh, you could, can mic, you switch the mic not, on? Is it on? Working. There's a point raised by the, the real YLH pushing back, saying that in Pakistan, we, uh, we don't trust our government and we trust corporations even less. <laughs> Continuing on that theme, uh, so Emily E T A Y L A W raised the idea that commentator, uh, commentators blame shareholder complacency for causing a financial crisis, but now there seems that there's a hope that they'll save internet freedom. Continuing, Christian Christensen, Christensen highlights that history shows that trust in corporations is misplaced. So what do we mean by trust, and how do we trust that they'll place ethics over profit? All right. Well, mm -hmm. the, the, these are all things I was quizzing you on earlier, which are kind of important. Yeah, yeah, but it's going to be really brief, because okay. I want to I get as much interactivity going as possible. So okay. now I'm going to be, be totally brief. disciplined with you. Sure. You've got to be quick. Okay, so I think this is a critical question, actually, because 95% of what we call cyberspace is in private sector hands. Right. It's getting more and more so. And we can't expect them to be regulated all the time by legislation and so on. We live in an international system, sovereign jurisdiction, and so on. Laws differ. They're, Corporations need to spend more time on due diligence around human rights. That's precisely why GNI, GNI for its shortcomings, which have to do the, with the companies itself, frankly, uh, is so important. And I think more companies need to be encouraged, especially in the telecommunications sector, where traditionally they've been uh, closely in line with national security agencies. It's a different culture right. in the big telecom carriers. They need to step up and consider human rights. Okay. And it, quickly, Can I respond uh, on that? Because that was a very specific telecom comment. Oh, go on then. Yeah. All right. And again, so, uh, the rules now are to be brief. Go I on. think it is actually promise, uh, possible to um, exercise due diligence without being a member of GNI. I mean, to, to, be, to be honest, we are a very large telecom company. We do a lot of human rights uh, due diligence. And, and you're not a member of GNI. And we're not a member of GNI. And why is that? And that is for, for many reasons. But the point well, I want to make. Give me the best one. The best reason is yeah. that we're, we're <laughs> focusing on the, um, the due diligence actually within our own company quite But wouldn't being inside GNI actually help you deliver on, on There's these There's a lot of different initiatives. Right now we're part of the Institute for Human Rights and Business, which is a uh, UK-based uh, NGO. We're working with them on respect for human rights and due diligence. We work with another organization called SHIFT. Uh, out of Boston that was actually involved in writing the guiding principles. Right. So we are very, very active in So you're not going to join GNI? No, not e today. E even if, even if uh, there was evidence to suggest it might actually boost trust in your motivation and, and belief in your rhetoric and make it more credible? You, uh, you know, my comment now, I don't want to make any comment about GNI. My comment was on the large, you know, telecommunications companies. Yeah, no, I know. And I think the, the thing here is when there is telecommunications sector has undergone decades of standardization, 
regulation and legislation to give some legitimacy to the issue, for example, of lawful interception. That's why we provide it to governments. We're provided by law. It's been you know, developed and emerged over two decades. And I think what's different now is the internet, because the internet and the cyber world as we live in it today is not regulated. So it is a difference in the value chain right. where you are and where things are, and, and that's the you. point that I want to point All out. All right, quickly, Renata. Super quickly, cyber, uh, new cyber security regulations, inside those, there's a big push with a trade secret law that mm. will, uh, like, higher protection, that will forbid citizens to look at the, uh, what, what uh, is really inside this kind of devices. Right. I cannot have, right now, a any expectation of a private communication using a common telephone anywhere in the world. If I, uh, 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 if I want to speak with someone, I have to do this to my telephone. I have to take out the SIM card. That's unacceptable. I mean, companies are not caring at all about uh, privacy of the citizens. And governments, on the other hand, are increasingly uh, classifying information about their deals with companies committed, committed uh, to human rights. So we do not know really what's going on between companies and governments, and we, can, uh, we will be even uh, forbidden to uh, explore, dig deeper in the activities and in the technologies used by companies and by governments to surveil the citizens. Right. Well, so, I'm just wondering, as Renata speaks, whether people in, in the room are, are, are sharing her quite profound fears about where this is going and, and how little Renata feels she can trust uh, big uh, corporations working in this field. But um, I know there were hands up over here, and I want to get to the back if there are hands up at the back as well. Uh, There's well, one in the middle back. Who's actually got the microphone at the moment? You have. Well, you've already got a head start then, so we'll start with you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Kirsty Hughes from Index on Censorship and also a willing member of GNI, unlike um, Ericsson's. Um, I wanted to ask a, a question to the whole panel and especially to Commissioner Malmström, um, which is, would you agree that there is never a case for mass population surveillance and data gathering? And in that case, especially to Commissioner Malmström, uh, would you agree that the EU and the European Commission should in future stand up and speak out very clearly if a member state does what the United Kingdom does and tries to push through mass population surveillance as it did with the Commons Data Bill now withdrawn due to parliamentary opposition in the UK? Thank you. Okay, so d did you hear that, Commissioner? Well, well yeah, I think so. Well, did, I hope everybody did. Uh, just the question is basically, would you uh, go on the record here and now, just between friends, all 300 of us, <laughs> Uh, and no, say I'm not there going is to comment on a proposal of a law that I haven't seen. No, that I cannot but, but, but the, no. the principle, no. but never the principle a case for of, of this sort of mass surveillance. Well, it, it depends. I can, no, I, I cannot do it. In principle, no, mass surveillance sh should not be allowed, but there could be cases w where it is, and it would not be for the Commission to... to uh, uh, to, to condemn that, but we are very actively working all over the world, including internally in the EU, to try to, to, uh, to wor work against that type of phenomena. And if it were to happen, that it was, as the former panel discussed, that it has to be very clearly regulated in law when the cases ca can be, that there has to be redress, that there has to be a judicial authority um, give, giving its authority. So just spontaneous mass surveyors, no, but that the specific law, I, I, I can't comment. All right, but I mean, if there's an issue with surveillance in Belarus or Iran or Thank North you. Korea, it's very easy mm -hmm. for us here in Western Europe to say, oh, that's outrageous, it could never happen yes, here. I mean, we the do, and we should commit yeah, but, it does, yes. but the truth is, it does happen here. Well, it's not really the same I mean, it's thing. Not, maybe no. it's not the same thing, and the intent <laughs> isn't the same, uh, you know, maybe. if one can get inside the heads of, of the uh, people running the surveillance. But the fact is that, you know, Western nations do run surveillance operations, mass surveillance operations. They, they do. Yes, yes. Department we do. of Justice yeah. and Associated Press. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Right. right. And that is Price to be of condemned. Warrantless yeah. word yeah. Can I can I make one point before Quickly, you? Quickly. Yeah. I I think that Western democracies want to feel secure because we op operate mostly in a rule of law world that it's okay for us to do these things in specific circumstances and that we can cabin that off and say it has no other impact. And we heard a little bit of that on the last panel. And I think that it is probably the most dangerous thing 
that we can say. Um, you know, and we have this fight in the United States all the time, the SOPA battle last year, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly its, um, its requirement to literally have ISP spoil domains. You want to talk about a security threat? Would have would have just been adopted everywhere in the world, you know, rule of law or not. So I think we have sure. to take our responsibility very, very seriously, not to become basically the source uh, of, of the problem. I got you. Right. I'm going to do three at once now. Uh, the lady uh, there with the microphone, then I'm going to go over there, and then I want that microphone to go to the lady at the very back, because we've got to reach some people at the back. So <laughs> you, then you, and then you. So starting with you, ma'am. Go okay. on. Okay. Good morning. So this is Salehi from uh, Reuters News Agency. I came from Iraq. Actually, it's a little bit frustrated and sorry to say that to listen to you uh, since this morning and see you that discussing this problem from your perspective, which mostly came from the high level or very advanced levels uh, of, uh, in countries that used uh, internet and uh, uh, got this kind of a freedom ages ago, maybe decades ago, while you forget that there is another kind of users for internet in the Middle East specifically. Uh, in my country, for example, people are dying daily because of suicide bombers or uh, car bombs attacks because of terrorism. And usually those people, the militants, using uh, internet to publish uh, their crimes and to encourage other peoples to re uh, join them, mm -hmm. recruiting their, uh, other peoples, uh, funding them, exchange the information to reach their uh, targets. I think uh, uh, we are dealing with a specific problem. Yes, I agree. Uh, the problem is uh, general, but I think the solution is different. You cannot speak about the security situation in US, Britain, or Sweden as you, uh, at the same time when you speak about the security situation in Iraq, or mm -hmm. Iran, or Syria. There is big difference in the circumstances. Mm -hmm. The problem is, uh, you have to divide the problem. You have to uh, keep in your mind that you are dealing with different people, different perspectives, different uh, uh, culture, and different traditions. And based on this, you have to, to decide what is your target. Are you targeting the governments? Are you targeting the, the users? Are you targeting the uh, um, uh, markets or the companies? The problem is, in our countries, we still have a big gap between uh, the users in the Western companies and the Middle East. Uh, in, uh, yeah, in the mid, uh, sorry, in the Western countries and the Middle East countries, people are still not educated very well about the benefits of the internet and how they can use it. Is they still thinking that this is the best way to get the pictures of a Playboy? magazine or sexy, uh, sexy pictures or sexy movies or in another side they, they think this is the best way to link the uh, militants which is uh, really very frustrated right. and sad to Ma see this. I, I think it, it's an excellent point and it, it reminds us we, we do need to remember that the discussion might sound very different in different parts of the world and, and I think your point about what's happening in Iraq today or Syria is a very good one. But uh, I, forgive me, I'm going to move on because I want to get as many voices involved as possible. So you've got the mic, so you go ahead. This, this morning I heard people not being angry. I'm a bit angry about this discussion, actually. Yeah. Um, I'm a angry because people say that there are good countries and bad countries. And I hear people say there is no answer. We have to find this all out. It's all new. And it's not all new. These questions were raised in the 19th century when our current liberal democracies were invented and, and created. It's not something new. There might be some new technology, but it's not that different from the telegraph. Um, it's not something very magical. Um, I think one of the base, basic fundamental things of what happened in the 19th century is that all the laws had some basic distrust of government in them. And that, is, and that is what we need. We need to be aware that, we, also in Europe, and I, I'm uh, an EU uh, inhabitant and citizen, uh, we need to have some of this basic distrust. We come of a history of uh, a lot of, well, mass murder in, in Europe that was based on, 
on having uh, surveillance, of having databases full of people. And uh, we don't want to have this, this fuzzy trust in government because it's all going so well, because we never know what the future will be. Okay. So just so I'm, I'm use gonna your... Yeah. I, I, do you mind if I, I... I just want to get as many people in as possible. Um, I think, again, you made a, a point very clearly, so I thank you for that. And I want to go right to the back now, to the lady with the mic at the back. Yeah. This is Juliana from Oshahidi, from Kenya. Uh, my question is specifically to Ron Debert and the panel also, to talk a little bit more about the Internet of Things and the security implications, uh, particularly when we have prototypes of um, future technologies being made all over the world and that production data being sent uh, to China or other countries, but then those particular governments may not allow encryption of that information, just to give one example. But also, if there are any um, recommendations for companies or organizations that are looking at a hardware play and are also still very connected to the ethos of the open internet. Okay. Um, well, there was one. Uh, let me just recap because as we go through, I don't want to throw people's comments away. There was a comment from the lady just saying, you know, be aware this conversation lo looks on the content can be very different if one's talking from Iraq or from Syria, where, frankly, at the moment, a lot of internet users, she says, are using the internet for malign purposes. You know, there is a real issue there with, with terrorism connected to dissemination of information on the internet, use of the internet for, you know, rallying support for militant causes. Do you, do you, did you sympathize with what she was saying to a certain extent? I, I believe in principles, universal principles applicable to all citizens all over the world. And I believe that any disruption and any interruption on communications is somehow an interruption on free speech. And once that is harmed, and once we start uh, with this exceptionalism due to the circumstances in X or Y country, mm -hmm. we are giving a green card to censors uh, to argue that that's the case. And I, I lived in a, in a country during a war, and there, the, there was a little degree of technology surveillance, but there the surveillance was human. Your neighbor looking at what you were doing, uh, you, the police spying on your trash can, and, and that led to any kind of abuses. And I think that once, uh, once uh, uh, this uh, state of siege uh, mentality and this exceptional mentality uh, starts flourishing here yeah. and there. It's, uh, you feel it's dangerous. Yeah. It's not, not only dangerous, but it is, uh, we are returning to a past of totalitarianism, I think. Right. Yeah. yeah, hang on, because we can't have a, everybody speak on everything anymore. We're going to run out of time and there's still plenty to talk about. Cecilia, yes or no? When the gentleman very powerfully said, in the end, we need, just as we've had in lawmaking and the way we approach public life since the 19th century, we need to maintain this basic distrust of government when we approach the issues of the digital age and the internet. Do you agree, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> Good. That's clear. Thank you. Yes, I you think, think, you uh, think a sound distrust on these issues is very, very important because there has been a tendency, not least after 9-11, uh, not only in the US, in Europe, but over the, the world, to focus a lot on, on surveillance, on databases, on creation of that. that we need to be very w wary about that. But, but it's not like they're built up just in, in mass surveillance. You can criticize individual, of, of some, some of them are probably not legitimate, but there are rules and laws that they need to comply with international laws, with European laws, there need to be parliamentary decision, there meet, needs to be some sort of judicial uh, surveillance, there needs to be checks and balances, uh, there needs to be a clear purpose limitation of all this. So if all this is there, then you can look at the, the individual laws, but in general to be skeptic towards this is, is sound and necessary. Okay. All right, and, and finally, very quickly, Ron, I think there was a, just a direct question to you to just sure. expand and briefly expand uh, on this, the importance of the Internet of Things and maybe the vulnerability that it exposes. Well, I, I think that all those comments are actually connected in that there's a, a, an uncomfortable reality we should address, which is 
the next billion users are going to come primarily from countries uh, in the global south, many of whom come from uh, regimes that are failed, fragile states, autocratic regimes. In many of those countries, religion plays a greater role, as we heard. That is going to impact the nature of the ecosystem of the Internet of Things. And we can see pressure being placed on companies. And finally, getting to this uh, excellent point made, the only disagreement around that, I would say, it goes back even further to ancient Greece. This is the idea of, of checks and balances around uh, the concentration of power. We're losing sight of that. The trick, of course, is how to apply it to the private sector where so much of the data that we mm -hmm. secrete oh, right. as users is now entrusted. That is a fundamentally new challenge. Yes. Um, let, let, I'm going to come enough? to you. That's, that's great. I, I just want to get the moderators back in with any uh, comments off the feed or questions that you spotted that you want to introduce at this point. Either of you? Can, I think it'd be good to, to elaborate on s describing, and this comes from Bolo B. Who is the authority to decide which country is civilized or categorically good and bad? Right. Well, we, we, we've <laughs> chewed that over a lot, whether it's even remotely useful to talk about the good and the bad in the international community. And I think we're all sort of beginning to feel <laughs> it's not terribly helpful. But uh, anything else? You just quickly, one more if you've got one. The idea that access is a, to communication is a basic human need has come up early in the panel. I think the parameters missing on that are where does price, access, and security fit in as part of the human need? Uh, I think I'm being thick because I didn't really understand that. <laughs> did, did anybody, un where does what? In addition to access to communications as a basic human need, yeah. where price of access is included, right. where um, the openness of the access, more the security of the access. Right. So it's sort of the the economics of it, and whether there's a right. I guess going back to the lady's point about considering this from the point of view of, of poorer and developing world countries, of, of the price uh, that is put upon access to the internet. We haven't really talked about that, but I'm not sure that's necessarily really for our debate today about freedom and security. Uh, sir, you've got the microphone. Tell us who you are and quick, quick point or <coughs> question. Sure. Das Walid al uh, I come from Yemen, but um, I teach here in Sweden at Erbil University. And my background is journalism. And I think I need to refer back and come back to that because power, power corrupts. We know that. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. And to keep powers in check, there are journalists usually. And being one of them, uh, I feel uh, quite compelled to bring in something very powerful. And I'm afraid that has been missed in this conference so far. Whistleblowers. Mm. Whistleblowers are not protected. And we need to ensure protection. And the moment when they were protected in somewhat uh, conveniently through uh, an example like WikiLeaks, which ironically has not been mentioned. I know we are in Sweden and they have a case. So, <laughs> but, but apart from that, we need to ensure that cases uh, where anonymity uh, needs to be secured uh, are referred to and not ignored. There are obviously uh, uh, cases where you need to track down or make sure that you know who did or posted what, but oftentimes it's for the use of anonymity is for the good. And we find many reasons why to uh, have whistleblowers in today's society. I mean, one example is the ongoing conflicts, and, and these are happening everywhere. In Syria, I have a program named El Qasr, and it's a circumvention tool, tool allowing people to post uh, videos without revealing their IP addresses. And that is crucial in today's world. And without that, I'm afraid we are not giving the essence of freedom and, and, and the fact that everyone should have a, a way to get and publish information without being prosecuted, without being threatened. Thank you. Okay, yeah, well, I th think you're right. Whistleblowing is a very important part of the conversation. Well, I'd, li I'd like to address the anonymity point because I think this is one of the big challenges in the cybersecurity context is that we have very prominent people basically saying anonymity is the enemy of cybersecurity. We have to do away with anonymity. Um, and to me, that's part of this broad brush, you know, 
overreaching kind of approach. Um, and you know, when I say that we need to self-educate and we need to focus, yes, if you happen to be have ex access to the power, you know, atomic power generating network, then yes, you probably need to be identified. Um, and you can, ident you can think about all kinds of other specific circumstances where identity is important. The problem is um, we've taken this and, you know, and, and I, I've heard this all over the world and, and certainly even in the United States and basically say um, attribution is the key problem, therefore everybody has to be identified. Um, and I share your concern because of the lack of nuance in, in being able to have a rational conversation that says where does attribution, which basically is being able to identify people, um, but, but matter and, and, how, and where does it not? And this is, this is part of the problem with the cybersecurity debate. But what we see in America right now is Obama, his administration using draconian laws, including the very old now Espionage Act, to go after right. whistleblowers in right. a way that actually even the Bush administration didn't do. It's, it's uh, extraordinary. But, but, but Obama's message is this. He says, look, I'm all for people inside um, uh, you know, the public administration, the, the government, the taxpayer-funded government of this country exposing incompetence, exposing corruption and, and that sort of wrongdoing. But I am not and never will be an advocate for people jeopardizing national, national security. Right. And the two, he says, are fundamentally different. And you cannot tolerate, quote unquote, whistleblowing if it is jeopardizing national security. Oof. It's the Trump card that trumps everything. It it's does. It's being pulled out now to justify it, all it, sorts it of things. It justifies actions. everything, and as I said at the beginning. But it's not always so wrong, I, is it? Just because uh, it, maybe you say it's overplayed doesn't mean it's well, always wrong. Well, you know, we've been, we've been through be this over and over again, and the release of the Pentagon Papers was, you know, going to bring down the country. So, you know, I, I, I've, I've long ago sort of given up on, 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 on the belief that, um, you know, a single person providing information to the press so that the public has a right to know what's going on in their government uh, is, is somehow going to bring down our country or anybody well, else's country. And now it's even worse with the new term, economic security. Come on, that's yeah, to protect that's All right. companies. Well, I, I, I can see which way the wind blowing is blowing on the panel. Uh, and we're not even going to talk about Julian Assange because it's just going to get too complicated. Uh, <laughs> let, 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 let's... Well, come on. <laughs> come on, too complicated. Well, I just, I, you know what? He's not here. He's in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. But there are people here who've got questions. So <laughs> let's... Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. I am Chris Obor again from Uganda. <laughs> and uh, my, my question will specifically go to the EU Commissioner. Because from the discussion so far, I also feel some sense of not belonging. Because the discussion seems to be premised on the Western democracies, which are premised on discussion and consensus. Mm. But in Sub Saharan Africa, there is coercion, not discussion. So I would like to hear more how this conference can help Sub-Saharan Africa if internet is delivered for us a homogeneous world. Because in Sub-Saharan Africa, the, the greatest need now is provision of the internet and understanding of the internet, which most people are excluded. The young population that's using mobile phones today can spend an hour trying to access internet. And that person cannot speak about cyber security before even access internet. So should we be discussing about provision in Southern Africa or we discuss security with the Western democracies which already cherish the, 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 the ethos of discussion and, the, and consensus. This is where the, the, the critical problem comes in. Because if we do not see different environments, then the response will be different. The internet freedom we're talking about, EU commissioner, will it turn into donor aid that goes to Pan Africa year in, year out. As poverty levels keep growing year in, year out, there should be a difference. The African people feel a bit cheated by the Western democracies. We pick the ideals, they are interesting, they are propelled these democracies, but when it comes to domesticate in our own environments, we we'll find problems. We are taught at school, democracy is a discussion. But we are subjected to a democracy of coercion. So when it comes to cyber security, 
we are not even secure with our own police officers. Mm. They sleep in tents. So it is difficult for me to go home and say, I have been in school home. It is important for our government to ensure our safety on the internet, which is not available. <laughs> this, is the, this is the biggest, well, course, biggest problem. Course, yeah. yeah, well, a uh, critical question. What, if anything, can you offer in terms of a, no, an EU effort to address that basic problem? But you're, of course, absolutely right. The, this perspective that I was trying to say was what about what we're doing in the European Union. But also we have actually a strategy uh, that, that has been elaborated together with my colleague who is responsible for external affairs and we discussed this a lot and it is part of the EU strategy to try to support in our neighboring countries including in Africa not only the accessibility, the, the infrastructure of internet, to support that through different kind of aids uh, and aid, aid and loans and so on, but also to have the defense of an open and free internet very much as a part of our, our uh, foreign policy. Okay, but Cecilia, yeah, I'm going to yeah. stop you there. Uh, we, uh, you, I'll come back. Yep, yeah, that, that was clear and it's some sort of commitment and, uh, you know, nobody's yeah. going to pretend it's going to be easy. But, no, of course uh, not. Right, I'm going to do, this is what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen. It's almost lunchtime. We're going to take three extraordinarily brief, concise, pithy and to the point questions. Uh, it's a bit of a lottery. Sir, you've been very patient. Yeah, you first and then we'll go over here. Oh, yeah. Hi, so I'm someone who's currently being investigated under the US Oh, yeah, I, you Act. know what, you had, a good, you had a good go before, didn't you, in the yeah. first panel? So I just wanted to point out this, this notion about lawful intercept. We should say so-called lawful intercept because actually it is the case in the United States that it is not lawful. And in some cases, when it is lawful, it is immoral. So in the case of the Espionage Act, where I'm being prosecuted, it is because I'm an independent investigative journalist that has been successful. And this yeah. is state terrorism of my life. And so this is sort of a, you know, a question to the commissioner here, which is that um, when I hear you talk about how we need to prosecute criminals and yet we need to secure cyberspace, I wonder if you're willing to concede that there is a disproportionate um, let's say, a disproportionate amount of power here to surveil, so much so that we lose the ability to actually be secure because we compromise our technologies in service of policy. And I wonder if you recognize that we can secure our communications on the Internet right now if we are willing to give up our wiretapping addiction. And so what I wonder is, why is it that you are stopping us, essentially, from having secure technology and saying it is to protect us, when in fact, by having wiretapping, we are unable to protect ourselves from anyone. And what about the right. economic well, well, impact? Stop now, that? because very quickly respond to that, and then we, I, we're going to take well, two The European more. Commission has no power whatsoever to regulate whether the nations do wiretapping or not. But yeah, yeah, I don't do it. Well, I guess you're saying... I'm not going to respond for every European government. Yeah, it, it's about the, member, the relationship between no, yeah. the centre and the member states. So let's not go there, because, no. Christ, if we start talking about the European <laughs> constitution, we'll be here till midnight. Um, a microphone over there. Um, thank you. My, I'm afraid my question is also for the com uh, ma Madam Commissioner. Well, you know what? She's paid to answer questions, so go I'm, for it. I think, I think there is a commitment you can you make pay to today. To ask them. <laughs> I think there is a commitment you can make today. I can think of two or three cases of activists whose activities have been disrupted. In some cases, their lives have been disrupted because of technology that was made in the EU. Mm. Would you today uh, take the commitment to help those activists prosecute those companies based in the US, uh, in the EU, sorry, and uh, which has made those spy technology right. uh, that disrupted their lives and, in some cases, destroyed their machines. Gotcha, sir. Gotcha. W will you make a commitment now to go after those companies in Europe that are aiding and abetting authoritarian regimes in their repressive policies? I can give you a list of the companies. Yes. <laughs> give me, me a too. list. I mean, you all want me to commit to things that, that, that I need much more information to do. But, but we do actually do a few of these cases. So, yes, give me more information and we'll have a look at it. And, and on the point uh, that was uh, coming from Ron earlier, he said, you know, um, there are a host of European companies that are flogging, mm. uh, you know, software and the capability for repression to repressive regimes, you know, on the internet. Uh, isn't, I mean, Europe's very good at, at, at banning arms sales to regimes we don't like in Syria and Zimbabwe and wherever. Mm. Why aren't we doing that with this sort of technology? Because Europe is not very good at agreeing uh, 
between the 27 member countries to have a tough scrutiny of themselves when it comes to these issues. And uh, when they don't agree, it is very difficult for the European Commission to act. You give me, you allocate a lot of power to me, I'm grateful for that. But, but <laughs> many things you ask me, it is not in my powers to do. Uh, but Europe has a problem in general to be, and, and that is a credibility problem. If we want to be very strong on freedom of internet or other human rights abroad, and we are to a certain extent, we can be tougher, then of course we must scrutinize ourselves because otherwise it becomes credibility. And there we have a lot of tools. It's not right. just European companies. No, sure, but as we have there's got plenty, a European Commissioner, plenty, I'm, that's why I'm poking this issue. There's plenty of Canadian and US issue. companies, but Canadian, there's, more, US, but there's more, yeah. Dia yeah. more dialogue about it I wonder what right BlackBerry now. is doing. Um, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, Renato, I'm not going to let you, I'm afraid, right now, because uh, I promised one more question, and then we're, our stomachs are going to start rumbling and we're going to need some food. Well, that, uh, that already as goes. the microphone's there, sir, you're the lucky guy with the last question. Mm. From Huawei. Yes, Andy Purdy uh, with Huawei Technologies. <laughs> Speaking um, of. I would Speaking suggest of. that we should not trust any government to monitor all internet traffic, whether it's Sweden, whether it's China, whether it's the United States. We should not trust any company in this country, whether it's Huawei, whether it's Ericsson, who are providing critically important equipment to our telecom networks. We need to agree on standards and best practices and requirements for transparency so we can make sure that we hold folks accountable to protect our privacy and freedom. No disagreement there. Well, that may be, well, in fact, it has to be the point we end on. I mean, a message there saying, you know, this is not about trust. It's not about taking people at their word. It's about holding institutions, whether they be private sector corporations or whether they be state agencies and governments, holding them to account and demanding from them real transparency. And I think maybe that's not a bad way to end. We have to end somewhere. This is, I think, several panelists have said, a, positive a massive, <laughs> massive well topic. From Huawei. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> It's great. It, well, it, 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 in a way, it's great. But you know what? I, I, and Renato, I know you're dying to say something else, yes. but you know, lunch is a priority as well, yeah, and everybody's been so patient. Lunch. Um, lunch. lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, it, it, this conversation will go on. Obviously, it'll go on in, in the corridors and the corners here at the Stockholm Forum. It'll go on for the next year. Freedom and security, <laughs> they're both intrinsic to the way we want to live our lives, but how we balance them out and how we make sense of them in the internet age, that's something that clearly is extraordinarily complex. But let me just thank a fabulous panel. They've been incredibly giving and insightful, so please give them a warm hand. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you too for the questions and for your attention for the last hour and a half. Go and enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs>